Welcome back. It is still the run-up. In about 15 years, Lagos has gone from being a symbol of urban disorder to a widely cited example of effective African governance. The Lagos state government have uh, succeeded in multiplying its tax revenues and using these resources to restore basic infrastructure and expand public services and law enforcement. Already Africa's largest city, it grapples with rapid population growth, overburdened infrastructure, an enormous informal economy, and a history of repressive military rule. The city's challenges are further compounded by the acute security threats and endemic corruption that affects Nigeria as a whole. And we will be looking at the transformation hopes for Lagos State and who is right, who is the right man for the job. And with us today is Mr. Funcho Doheti. He's the ADC governorship candidate for Lagos State. You're welcome to the program. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> it's nice to have you. Uh, so let us uh, kick, kick off this way, Mr. Funcho. Uh, you are vying for the first a seat of the first man in Lagos State. Mm -hmm. And what does being a Lagosian mean to you? Uh, well, uh, I'm very proud to be a Lagosian. <laughs> okay. um, I, I, I was born in Lagos, raised in Lagos, primary, secondary, university here in Lagos. Oh, wow. And uh, my family is a, a well-known Lagos family uh, from Lagos Island. And uh, Lagos has been home to us for generations and generations, centuries, actually. And, um, you know, it's a city we all love. Uh, it's a city that in many ways is more developed today because of modern technology and so on than the city we grew up in. But it's also a city uh, that in many ways is, um, is more chaotic than the mm -hmm. city we grew up in. Um, and so some of us look back on those days and say, you know, there are certain things about those times that we've lost along the way. And, um, uh, and we are saying that we need to restore some of those things even as we seek to move Lagos into the first world and bring it among the ranks of, um, of modern mega cities where it belongs. Mm. Okay, you've mentioned something that you know, has to do with the next question I was going to ask you because uh, you've mentioned how that a lot of things has been lost on the way, I mean, in the process of growing Lagos. But what is your, what is your view on the current state? You mentioned that there are things that are supposed to be put in place. What are those things? So my own view about the current state of Lagos, and, and um, you know, I noted your int introduction, and, and I actually disagree with the fact that, uh, with the theory or hypothesis that Lagos is an example of effective governance. I actually think that governance is one of the weakest points in Lagos. Mm. Um, Lagos is a city, I think, that has been managed well below its potential. Mm. So if you think about Lagos, Lagos uh, has tremendous resources, uh, it's probably the most blessed uh, of cities uh, in Nigeria. This year alone, our budget is 1.7 trillion naira, which is the budget of many cities combined, many states combined. Um, now, if you look at, and this is adjusted for inflation, similar amounts have been spent over the years. So if you look at where we are today, where we ought to, in comparison to where we ought to be, given the amount of resources that have been um, expended, you ca actually cannot say that Lagos is doing well. Um, there are, um, and there are a number of things you can point to as evidence of this. Just one of them is the uh, recent uh, release of the Economist Intelligence Unit uh, ranking of cities. They call it the livability ranking, mm. which ranks cities across the world. And Lagos is ranked 171 out of 172. Uh, on that list. Um, and that's a list that looks at things like infrastructure, education, health, stability, and culture and environment. So it's fairly comprehensive. So in truth, we have to look at it and say, um, have we done well? And this is after a generation, actually, of governance by one ruling party. Uh, 23 years by the time we do the next election, 23 years is almost a generation. Uh, and we're saying we should be much further along than where we are. Mm. And, um, you know, you can't continue doing the same thing and expecting a different result. We don't want to invest another generation um, only to say that we are even further away from where we should be. So we think it's time to put Lagos on a path 
that would um, that would lead us uh, to the first world, which is where we ought to be. So your last statement, you think it's time to put Lagos on the path. Is this what informs your desire to be the governor of the state? Yes, because like many other Lagosians and many who live in Lagos, um, you know, we see the um, shortcomings, we see the deprivations. And in a democracy, the only way you get to good governance is if people who have the capacity, the competence and the character step mm -hmm. up. Um, and if the people then support them um, into, into office, right? Um, this is how you get to good governance. Now, if you look at quality of life, I have been across the state, from local government to local government, having town halls, consultative town halls with, with, um, with um, citizens across the state. And, you know, the concerns of Lagos are fairly consistent across the state. Uh, people are living a poor quality of life. People are uh, facing deprivations in many, in many aspects of their life. People complain about things like traffic, the fact that they spend four or five hours going to work and coming back every day. Uh, apart from the time lost, there's the impact on health, there's the impact on the environment. These are things that, are, that have a real human cost beyond the inconvenience of them. People complain about the fact that they can't, uh, they are not comfortable sending their children to the public schools. That they have to scrimp and save to send their children to private schools, even when they can't afford it. People complain that the healthcare facilities operated by the state, they do not trust them. People would rather go to traditional uh, mm -hmm. practitioners or pharmacists or what have you. Um, people complain about the agro problem in Lagos. Everywhere I go, I hear it. And this is a big problem in Lagos. Mm. You know that in Lagos, the cost of living, a big part of the cost of living is cost of transportation. If you're a driver, for example, take an example, a driver who lives in Ikorodu, maybe walks in VI, right? Each month, you know that that, that that citizen's cost of living, a big part of it is transportation. Mm. And a big driver of transportation cost is this agro um, um, problem, right? Because if you talk to commercial drivers, they tell you in a given day, maybe five, six, seven thousand, each driver has to pay over to these um, to these agros. Over loading, over chairman, over this, over that. At the end of the day, that money is coming from the pockets of the passengers. So um, these are multiple deprivations that has, uh, our people face, and we are saying that um, our agenda which we have for Lagos, which we call the Tiger Agenda, which I can talk about in more detail, mm -hmm. has an overall objective to improve the quality of life of citizens, to give them dignity and respect, and to lay a foundation for Lagos in the first world. Okay. Uh, let, let's talk about your agenda now, actually. It was going to be the next thing. Uh, the Tiger Agenda. One of the major things I discovered wh when I went through it is actually that transportation is... Uh, very much represented. And you cannot talk about transportation in Lagos without talking about the traffic mm -hmm. and then spe most especially the agro problem, just as you mm -hmm. mentioned. It, it's, it has lingered. Mm -hmm. And for every time we put up posts on our social media mm -hmm. platforms, we've had other you know, gubernatorial candidates come around. Mm -hmm. People in the comment section cannot seem to look away <laughs> from the agro problem. Absolutely. And that's a question that we put to everybody. And so I'm putting it to you. What, what practical solutions do you have on ground to solve that problem? OK, so the first thing is to address it with political will. Mm. Um, and so, so the first thing is that the present administration, part of the problem why it has lingered, is that the present administration is not in a position to deal with it because those guys are a core part of the political support of the current administration. And therefore, they are part of the power structure of the state. So the moral authority to deal with the problem is not there. It's not that necessarily it is an intractable, unsolvable problem. But to the extent that these folks are part of the power structure, the moral authority and the political will to solve the problem is not there. Beyond that, what you have to understand is that this... Um, 
this thing is almost operating almost like a criminal enterprise, mm. right? So you have the guys who are on the streets, you call them the runners, right? The guys who are chasing the commercial drivers, collecting, the, you know, you have those guys. But it's a pyramid, there's a chain, right? So they are funneling those resources to higher ups and higher ups, right? Ultimately, these resources are not going into government coffers. They're not going into coffers of Lagos State government. There may be a small portion of it that gets to you know, government quarters, but most of it is not. And so what you have to do, basically, first of all, is to, um, is to curb their activities and say, OK, let us determine what it is that is being, with its revenues that are being collected. Are they union dues? What are they? If they are union dues, there must be a basis for it. The union must operate based on certain guidelines and standards and laws mm -hmm. which are consistent with the laws. You can't operate outside of those laws. So we'll insist on that, right? Then we will, we will prevent them from, from operating on the streets in the way that they do because it's a health hazard. They're running on the streets. They are creating, causing uh, cars to swerve and all of that. We will stop that. Then, um, if you look at the numbers, at the same time, and one of the things that people have said is that uh, these folks, you know, this is one way of keeping them busy because otherwise they will go to crime mm -hmm. and all of that stuff. But you cannot have a, a, a solution that solves a problem for a small section of your society and then create a big problem for the mass of your society. Mm. So we're saying, we'll go in there, we'll find a way to, um, to, to get those guys engaged in other ways. Um, and you will find, by the way, that the cost of getting them engaged and where the revenues are going, it's only a small proportion of revenues that is going to all these many people, these foot soldiers. Most of the money being generated is probably going into private pockets. Mm. Do you see what I mean? So if you break that criminal enterprise, you can actually deploy resources to dealing with the problem of the many foot soldiers, right? With only a fraction, actually, of the revenues that are being taken from the pockets of the passengers. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so it's really about having the political will, understanding the problem, uh, being able to um, set rules, um, set standards, because you are not afraid to do that, because it is not those people that elected you. So if the average citizen elected me, I am responsible to the average citizen. I'm not responsible to the agro. To the extent that the agro is an average citizen, yes. <laughs> but if he or his activities or the activities of their unions mm -hmm. are infringing on the well-being of the broader citizenry, we will absolutely be in a position to deal with it because we're not, we don't owe them anything other than what we owe the average citizen. Okay, <coughs> excuse me. Okay, so we're still talking transportation. Uh, sometime in the early 2000s, the BRT buses were deployed in Lagos. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, recently there's been a lot of conversations around the rail tracks and bringing them back to life. But then, transportation has continued to be a very big problem in mm -hmm. Lagos. Now, do you think these put together, um, I mean, these other means of transportation I just mentioned put together with what we already have mm -hmm. is enough? And if not, what do you have coming? So we think that Lagos uh, needs to have more options available. The citizens of Lagos need to have more options. Um, Lagos is a coastal city. And we have the lagoon, which runs across the state. So Lagosians actually should have, we should have, we should, we should use, make much more use of our waterways than we have historically. Mm. Um, and that's one way to decongest key routes on the roads, right? And, and address part of this uh, traffic problem. Because if you identify certain key routes and then put robust options on the waterways for people to patronize, um, robust vessels that people feel comfortable and safe in, as opposed to these little boats that are zooming around on the lagoon, um, you'll find that more, more people will engage with that. And you can do it in such a way that the scale of it then causes the cost to come down. Right? So that's one element. Second is the real element, 
Now, you know that this present administration has struggled with just one axis of rail construction for almost 15 years. And it's not been delivered. We understand now that they are on the verge of delivery. Whether they are testing, whether they are delivering, we don't know. Time will tell. But even if they deliver it today, the question is, why 15 years? Others who have done it have done it in a much shorter period, on a much grander scale. When we want to expand it to the next line, and when we spend another 15 years for the next, uh, the next axis of travel, so, I mean, clear, and then we don't know how much it costs. We don't know whether there was overrun. Why did it take, I'm sure they did not award it for 15 years when they awarded it. Why did it take so long? What actions have been taken? So these are the transparency and accountability problems that we see in Lagos State, mm. which is phenomenal. In a state with massive resources, when you have transparency and accountability problems, it's a big problem. That's why I said governance, to me, is our biggest problem in Lagos. Mm. You see, there are other states where that are much earlier along in their development cycle. So they're actually looking for, excuse me, they're looking for people to come and establish businesses in their own state. Lagos is not in that situation. By, by, by history, by the fact that it was a former uh, state capital, by the fact that it has been a commercial capital for centuries, there's an existing base here in Lagos. And that base needs to be managed and governed with transparency. And the managers of the city, the leaders of the state, must operate the state in a selfless way for the benefit of the citizens, understanding that the office that they represent is a sacred trust and deploying those resources in a way that would spread the prosperity of the state to a wide proportion of the state. One of the tragedies of Lagos in the last 23 years is that the resources of the society and the state and even the government have been concentrated right, in a narrow section of the, of the population. And um, this is the effect uh, of, of, of a lack of transparency and accountability in governance. And what we are saying is that there's a new paradigm mm. that we should deploy. You should have leadership that essentially operates with the mandate of the people, acting in the interest of the people broadly, and taking decisions such that at the end of the day, you build a prosperous society that is broad-based, because that's when you create jobs. That's when you create um, livelihoods, quality of life for the broad proportion of the population, rather than having a few who are doing extremely well and the vast majority of the people who are being impoverished. All right. Uh, we're still talking with uh, Mr. Funsho Doheti. He is the ADC gubernatorial candidate for Lagos State. And this is the run-up here on Plus TV. We're going on a quick break. When we return, we're going to keep having this conversation. Do not go anywhere. Stay with us. And you're very welcome back to the run-up. And uh, we've been talking to the ADC gubernatorial candidate for Lagos State in the person of Ashpunsho uh, Doheti. Welcome once again. Thank you. Okay, let's start off again mm -hmm. this way. Uh, Lagos has predominantly been governed by the ruling party. Yeah. Uh, even though there's been a kind of tweak one way or another, but there's been like a long time mm -hmm. of these people in power. And you know, one word that has been very popular through this particular electoral period yeah. is um, structure. Mm -hmm. They say some people have structure, some don't. Uh, but then let me put it to you as a rep of the ADC in the studio this mm. morning. Do you think that the ADC have the structure in place uh, to win the governorship election as well as other elections across the state? So um, in one word, yes. <laughs> uh, and I'll elaborate. Um, a ADC, by the way, is not a new party, as mm. I'm sure you know. ADC has been around since about 2006. And so we have a structure actually in the state, actually across the country. Um, it's, one of the, it's one of the parties with a national presence and a national spread. 
And in Lagos, we actually have a structure across the local governments. Uh, like I told you, I've been going around the local governments and engaging um, with the people uh, using our structure mm. through the, the state. So there's that. But I would even go further and also say that, you know, this question of structure, two things. One, it means different things to different people, right? When you say structure, there are different things that it's used to mean. Um, um, but also the, the significance and relevance and importance of the different kinds of structure um, is changing also as our electoral process is changing. Mm. So it is important to have representation in the communities, in the wards, at the polling units, etc. Um, just as it is anywhere you have a political system. Now, but another way in which structure has historically been used is as a, in a negative sense, where you have people within those communities and in those uh, vicinities, essentially um, either through coercion or either through um, suppression or those kinds of negative activities mm -hmm. to impact the, um, the, the outcome of election. There's another aspect of it which has to do with influencing even the collation process of elections. Historically, as you know, one of the ways in which elections have been manipulated in the past is because, you know, if you have three polling units and you have two votes in each polling unit, the total should be two plus two plus two, which is six. But by the time they get to the collation center, that two plus two plus two can become 50, right, historically. Mm. Um, so, but there's been a lot of change in the electoral process now with the new electoral act, with the introduction of technology, which means that a lot of those things, the avenues for them, have been curbed. Mm. So what you see, and this is why many of us are very hopeful about 2023, is that there's much greater potential for the will of the people to be reflected in the outcome of the elections now. And so, you know, the ability of, you know, some structure on the ground to change the will of the people on election day is greatly diminished. Mm. So it's really more about directly engaging the people and having people believe in your candidacy and in the fact that they want to give you the mandate to go and represent them. And then coming out on election day to vote. And if that happens, all the structure in the world will not change that. So it's good to have structure, and we do. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, in today's environment, it's more about the people, um, connecting with the people, having the people believe that you are the direction in which they want to go in, and coming out on election day and voting. Remember that historically, a big problem that we've had is participation. So in Lagos, the present governor was elected with only 700,000 votes. That's 15% of the, of the electorate. That's uh, people, you know, registered voters. So for every one person that came, five people stayed away. For every one that came, five stayed away. So if only one out of those five comes in 2023, we will double the number of votes mm -hmm. that we had in 2019. Only one out of the five. If two come, we will have three times the number of votes. So it's a very, and you know how people are feeling about this whole elections in 2023. People are a lot more engaged. Mm -hmm. People are a lot more insistent that, you know, they need to do something. People are feeling that, um, you know, that we can't continue like this. And we understand why. Because people are facing all sorts, all manner of deprivations, whether they are young, middle-aged, or old. So, um, look, um, it's not going to be... Business as usual, it's not going to be same or same or 2023 will be very exciting. And I think we should just pull up our seats and, um, <laughs> and bring out the popcorn. Oh, yeah, I was going to ask that. I think we should get popcorns too. Okay, uh, I, I was going to ask what the, you know, um, elaborate plan for Lagos State is and how you intend to achieve that. But I, I want to narrow it down to the economy. I mean, for someone who's been in the financial industry mm. as well, um, 
people, Lagos State is the largest, mm -hmm. one of the largest, if not the largest uh, economic hub in Africa. Mm -hmm. And of course, in Nigeria, mm -hmm. it is. But then conversations around some quarters say the economy of Lagos is mm -hmm. not as it should be. Be. Mm. I mean, we've seen industries come and mm. pack up and leave mm. as well. And mm. then you can imagine what it is like in other cities in the in the country. But then mm. we're talking about Lagos today. Mm. Uh, how how do you feel about the economic state of Lagos, and what would you do differently? So again, this is an area where I think that Lagos has been blessed with a lot, mm. but has done has not done as much with it as you know it could. You know, it's like the parable of the talents, right? You know, one guy was given 10, another guy was given 5, another guy was given 1. And the guy who was given 10 was expected to come back with 10, not come back with 5, and then compare himself with the man who had 5 and say, I have 15. No. And this is the problem with Lagos. Um, you know, Lagos has been a commercial center for centuries. Never mind people who say that they, are, they, de they developed Lagos within the last 25 years. We know, <laughs> we know the history of Lagos. Yeah. We know the history of Lagos. So um, the, the managers of this city are entrusted, actually, with a great asset, which is this state, its industrial base, its commercial base, uh, even its infrastructure base, much of which was inherited as a state uh, capital, former state capital. So much more could have been done. What are some of these areas? And if you look at it relative to our Tiger agenda, you see that our agenda addresses many of these things directly. First of all, <clears throat> the leakages within the system should be blocked. So our first T in Tiger is tax reform for equity, prosperity, and growth. Right? There's a lot to be done there. First of all, there's part of our resources that's been collected at source by an entity called Alpha Beta. We are going to remove that one first, right? Because the work that they are doing is very questionable. We don't know the, the few people who own that company, and there's no reason why they should keep a share of the people's money, my money and your money. The LIRS is there. They will do the work. In fact, they're the one doing the work now because the LIRS is the one chasing taxes and so on. Alpha Beta is basically keeping records and so on, and then collecting a share of the revenue. It's, it's unconscionable. We'll remove it. Then we we'll fix the tax system such that people who earn the most pay the most. People who earn least are relieved of certain burdens of tax. That is a way of, again, distributing resources to ensure that the, the prosperity is broad-based. We will stop the harassment of small businesses, undue harassment of small businesses, and create a tax environment that incentivizes the creation of jobs and the establishment and entrepreneurship. Government is, will become supportive of those businesses rather, be, rather than being a predator on those businesses. Infrastructure is key, the eye in our tiger agenda. It's important, you see, because um, for a modern mega city, you need a range of infrastructure. You need transport infrastructure, we talked about that. But there's waste management, there's power, um, there's, there's, um, there's, there's um, technology and telecoms infrastructure, there's even a security infrastructure. All of these things are central in a modern mega city, and I've talked about some of them, and, and I can talk more. The G in Tiger agenda is, is government reform. That's actually the foundation of our agenda. Mm. And we are saying that a few things are needed. One, everybody who works for Lagos State government must be reasonably compensated. They must earn reasonable compensation as an employee of Lagos State government. Um, and we will do that. And then having done that, we will insist that people are accountable and transparent and work with integrity in the service of you and me as citizens of this state. Right? And we will ensure that they understand that the seats that they are occupying, whether they are a civil servant, whether they are a public officer, whether they are a commissioner, whether they are a governor, is the people that put you there. And you are there to serve the people. And you serve them. If you don't, and if you serve yourself, and if you are corrupt, we will strengthen the Attorney General's office, we will strengthen enforcement, surveillance, audit, and we will prosecute diligently. And we'll ensure that people who are there understand the trust that their office represents and they abide by it. And if they don't, we will take action and there will be consequences. When you do this, people's actions as government employees and as, as public officers and leaders will come in line 
with the interests of the people. They will not be taking self-serving decisions anymore. They will not be deciding what do the people need, what do the people want, what can we do for the people, how do we do it mm. in a way that is up above board because we know that if we don't do it in a way that is above board, eyes are on us and this government is serious. And by the time we make examples of a few, I'm telling you, the whole tone will change. E, education and health systems that the people trust, important that people trust. That's the key, that people trust. Because when they trust a system, they will go. You don't need to call them to come. So in health, primary health care is one of our main things. But primary health care only works when people come, right, access the facilities when things are still, you know, can still be dealt with easily. And even, even for children, for example, before even anything goes wrong, bring the child for a checkup every three months or whatever. This is how it's supposed to work. Right? But if people don't trust the system, they will not come. So it's not about building the most fancy facility mm. or the, you know, spending you know, billions and trillions. No. It's about ensuring that the people are well paid, which I've talked about, and then having the monitoring and engagement systems to ensure that in the processes and the quality control systems to monitor the experiences that people are having. That way, people will access your system. Education, curriculum, teacher quality, vocational options. I mean, I can go on and on. Um, but I'm sure we have limited time. On R, uh, just to conclude on the entire agenda, the R is for rule of law and public order. There's a lot of chaos on the streets of Lagos. There's a lot of chaos. You can just go into work and coming back every day. can give you high blood pressure in Lagos. Right? So... This chaos is not, we are used to it now because that's what we see. Mm -hmm. But you know, it could be different. Right? Nigerians travel. When we travel, you know, we, we, you know, we, we conform. <laughs> you know? So we just need to deal with it. And this is the area, rule of law and public uh, order, where things like the agro problem and dealing with it come into our own agenda. So it's fairly comprehensive. Like I said, this is an agenda that will set Lagos on the path for the first world and then deliver quality of life, dignity and respect to the wonderful citizens of Lagos. Okay, um, I'm going to ask you a personal question, but that is after I ask you this. Uh, what is the plan for the youth, the young person on the streets of Lagos? They are, they've been categorized as being very creative, very innovative. And, you know, everything you've said actually interconnects. But then I want to narrow it down to the young persons. These people have industries, just like you've mentioned, that they've created by themselves and they are working so hard to push it to move. We'd say that Nigeria's uh, entertainment and music industry is thriving. It is actually young people in mm -hmm. Lagos, young people all around the country, uh, you know, buying studio equipments with their savings and <laughs> making hits mm -hmm. in their bedrooms mm -hmm. and everybody's dancing to it all over the world. And I could go on listing things that young people do just to support themselves mm -hmm. and move forward. Mm -hmm. And Nigeria's population, I think 70% of Nigeria's population are actually of people who are under the age of 30. So wh what is your plan for the young population of Lagos State? So thank you. And it's an important question. You know, the, the youth actually are not, they're not our future. They are our present. Mm. Right. And, you know, as you've said, the median age in Nigeria is, uh, is about 17, which suggests that about half of the population or half of the population are that age or below. So for Lagos, it's actually not, and for Lagos, it's particularly important because of our size and because of the, again, the size of the population. So it's not optional. Mm. We have to not just keep these people engaged but they are the ones that actually that will drive the prosperity. So it's not as if we are doing them a favor. In a way, they are doing us a favor. You see what I mean? And we just need to equip them and give them the support to help us also, right? Now, um, everything that, if you look at our agenda, we have something we call focus industries, for example. And when I talked about tax incentives and so on, we have something we call focus industries. And there you'll see entertainment you will see tech. These are some of the industries that are peopled by young people. It's just the way those industries are across the world. There are also industries, by the way, in which Lagos has the potential to be a, a competitive, to have comparative advantage and to be a world champion. Mm -hmm. We're already a world champion in entertainment, you know. Mm -hmm. 
yes, if you ask Bonner Boy, he'll tell you the same thing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so we are already a world champion in that space. Yeah. And what we need to do is just to build on that, right? We need to build on that. And we, as a government, will put whatever is needed, whether it's in terms of the infrastructure, whether it's in terms of the support, well, like I talked about, because a lot of these businesses are small businesses, mm -hmm. right? They are small people doing their things. So, you know, if somebody establishes a small business, two, three, or four, or five of them, the thing is not for government to come two weeks later with four government agencies to say, have you done this, have you done that, or what? Government should be supportive to help them create those jobs because the truth is they're solving a problem for us as a society, and they're building prosperity for the society. And that becomes an export base, and then we create... Let me just touch on a couple of other things that are related to this agenda. You know, I talked about the educational system. I talked about vocational options. Mm -hmm. So that's an important part of our strategy, right? To ensure that people, because every, not everybody's going to get a desk job. These are not desk jobs that you're talking about, but they are very valuable jobs. They build prosperity within the society. Our educational system should actually be enabling people to develop those skills that then enables them to go out and create those opportunities and establish those one, two, and three, and four person businesses. So expanding the vocational options in our educational system is a core part of our, of our agenda. Right? And, um, and with this, you see that you know, it, all of the various pieces then start working together uh, to create this foundation for prosperity that actually is important, not even important, it is crucial for Lagos to be sustainable. The final thing is to say that when you uh, uh, give people the skills to um, not just book skills now to come and be a, you know, a, an office worker, but broad range of skills, including vocational skills. One of the things we need to do as a society is to build a skilled workforce. And most of those will be young people. Because mm. what then happens is that because of the natural advantages that we have, Lagos is a port city right down the port with a large population, most of whom are English speaking, by the coast, young population, and a big market. So if you think about it, it's a natural, naturally attractive destination for somebody to establish an industry, right? Because you have the market right there, you have the port there, you can export, you have the people who, you know, it's, so it has, it's, everything is there. So what the, a, one piece that you need to strengthen is the skills of the people to operate those industries because people are also looking for a skilled workforce. So here again is another as aspect of where you empower the kids to now become the engine because then they become an attractive resource that others will now come um, to tap into. All right, and down to the personal questions. Uh, you've, you've been in the private sector for about 30 years uh, and then now you're in politics. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you think you have the credentials and confidence and, you know, to gather the votes of Lagosians and do you have what it takes to get them to trust you and give you their confidence to lead them for the next four years? What do you think? I'm asking you. <laughs> you tell me. So, look, um, you see what Lagosians are asking for mm. is leadership. They are asking for leadership that acts in their interests. They are looking for people who would go into that office and take decisions that is about them, not about the people themselves. That's about the, the, that's the citizens. You understand? Leadership has a character. Leadership has a character. It's not everybody who is suited for leadership. And one of the reasons why I have stepped into the race, and, and it should not just be about me. There are others like me also are doing the same thing, actually. Mm. Stepping into the race and saying, look, you know, we have demonstrated the leadership. I have run three different companies in the private sector as managing director and CEO, two of which are national companies, customers in the hundreds of thousands. And those businesses are still there, doing well. So in terms of credentials, people can go, and um, I'm well known, by the way, in the, in the private sector. And people can go there and, and ask those questions and ask the people who are there and ask the people who have interacted with me. I've actually also led, an industry, led industry groups. So, so been, been, been elected by my co-CEOs to be their leader 
of the industry group in interacting with regulators, legislators, and so on and so forth. So, so the track record is there. And the leadership, leadership is not about whether, and by the way, anywhere in the world, mm. you see this transition. People who have done well in the private sector coming to offer themselves for service in the public sector and going on and, and, and bringing those capacities in the public space and doing well. We, we see it in, in democracies where we've borrowed this democracy from. So it's a natural progression. What do people need or what do we need in a leader? You need somebody who has vision. You need somebody who has character, courage, right? determination, the conviction, right? the empathy. Somebody who carries people along, who is open, who is transparent, who has um, the desire to um, set things on the path to the vision and galvanize people around that vision. And I think that this is what people have lacked. Mm. And this is what we bring. And, um, and at the end of the day, it's the people that will choose who they want to lead them. All right, quickly, because you're rounding off now. Uh in the next couple of minutes. Let's talk about INEC. There's been a lot of innovations, uh, changes to bringing in technology and you know, the INEC chairman has been speaking with a lot of confidence when he says things like, we're going to deliver a free and fair election and uh, with the beavers and every other technology that has been brought in. What's your, what's your take on that and how do you feel about how they've been going about the whole electoral process throughout this season? So my own view, and this is my view, mm. um, is that, um, is that um, I'm encouraged. I think that INEC has a tremendous challenge mm. in the work that they have to do. It's not a trivial assignment that they have. And uh, you know, the context in which they are doing it, Nigeria is, some, is also not the easiest terrain to be doing that work. But, but I think they've done well, so far, I think we have to support and encourage them. I think some, um, some, some courageous steps have been taken. Um, and we also have the gift of the new Electoral Act, which has the incorporation of technology and so on, the beavers that you talk about. And INEC has been resolute in saying that they're going to push forward with it. And I think it's, it's, that's a courageous decision. It must be supported and we must, um, we must um, do everything to ensure that um, you know, as they take those steps, we also play our own part to ensure that we have the outcomes that we want. Look, at the end of the day, um, I believe that the, whilst elections are never perfect, the people in America from whom we borrowed this democracy, they are still complaining about their own last election that they did, mm. whether there was you know, this or that. But we know that for the most part, elections were free and fair. And that is where I believe we will come out in 2023, that you may be able to point to one, two, or three things across the system. But generally, my view is that it is the will of the people that will prevail. And if you have that as an outcome from a democratic process, you really can't complain. With the will of the people of free and fair elections, do you yes. think you would win? Absolutely. Mm confidence. I like that. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Daheti, for taking your time to come on the show and speak to us. Uh, we wish you the absolute best. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. You're welcome. And uh, that was Mr. Funcho Doherty. He's the ADC governorship candidate for Lagos State. And... Uh, it was an amazing conversation. If you were listening, if you, if you missed that, you might want to go to our YouTube chat page and, you know, get updated. It's at Plus TV Africa. And this is how we draw the curtain closed on today's show. Thank you so much for being a part of it. We want to say a big thank you to our viewers for staying tuned on the show and also for your contributions. If you miss any of these episodes, again, go to our YouTube page at Plus TV Africa and stay updated. Also remember, as citizens of this great nation, Nigeria, you have a right to vote. And it is expected that you exercise your voting right. You have a role to play in recreating the Nigeria of our dreams. So whatever you do, get up, go and get your PVC and make sure that you vote right. Shun election violence, shun vote buying, and of course, vote right again. My name is Uchechuku.
another to have a great day